Now please welcome head of Google Health, David Feinberg. First check I ever got, I had the ball on him. Dry sticks, so this shit don't never stop. When I'm lonely, yeah, I let that money talk to me. Ain't about to pay, and I don't get involved. First check I ever got, I had the ball on him. First check I ever got, I had the ball on him. Hey, I'm so, so happy to be here. This is the only conference that I ever get to do where they ask you to pick your music when you walk out. And so for the second time, I've got to play one of my son's songs. So that song, Eric Bellinger, Ball On, please listen to it on YouTube Music. So uh, really, really excited to be here. You know, I've been at Google for about nine months now. And there were two questions that were really important to me in making the decision to go from the provider side into technology. I'm not a tech guy. And the first question that I needed to answer was, is Google serious about health? And the second question was, if I could be convinced that we were serious, could we have an impact? And so what I'd like to do today is answer those two questions. Are we serious and can we have an impact? And I'd also like to introduce you to Google Health. So the theme of the conference is about the future, but I thought it would make sense to take a quick step back into the past. Okay, so um, Google, what we're going to do is take that same voyage, only we're going to go in a different direction. Instead of going from outside the body in, we're going to start inside and go out. And this is to answer that question about seriousness. So the first place we're going to stop is the human genome, but we're going to go by quickly because we've got to get to the kidney, okay? So human genome, we know that there's a wealth of information here that requires an am am amazing amount of storage and analysis. And Google Cloud and our deep variant especially our deep variant, has become the industry standard in understanding clinical variations. And we're going to come back to the genome in a second, but let's get to the kidney. We heard Mark talk about artificial intelligence. Let me tell you the story about the kidney. So about two months into the job, I go over to London where our team is working with some incredible clinicians there. I walk in the hospital, and this nurse named Nurse Mary walks up to me, and she goes, this app is so good that I was going to quit nursing two years ago, but I stayed in nursing. And I'm like, whoa, I'm a guy from healthcare. I've never seen technology actually make people happy. So I'm like, wow, so tell me about the app, Mary. She goes, well, I'm part of the rapid response team. So I get a message when patients are sick. Uh, and in this particular case, what our app does is look at one variable from the kidney, this thing called creatinine. And if creatinine goes up, Mary and her team get a, a note on the app they can communicate with each other, and they go and see the patient. So what are the results? Well, the results are it used to take us four hours to recognize acute kidney failure. It's down to 14 minutes. 30% less patients have had cardiac arrest, and the cost of care has decreased 17%. So I'm like, whoa, that's pretty incredible. And then the team says, well, what if we apply AI to this? Instead of looking at creatinine, that one variable, what if we take 70,000 patients, and we did this with the VA, and instead of looking at creatinine, we look at 600,000 variables per patient, 600,000 times 70,000 patients. What happens now to our ability to predict acute kidney injury? It goes from four hours to 14 minutes to minus two days. So we're able to predict before any clinical signs come up that this patient with a 90% accuracy is gonna end up on dialysis two days before there's any clinical indication. So pretty cool that AI can do predictions. Let's take a quick stop and look at what we can do to help pathologists and radiologists improve their diagnostic accuracy. So with breast cancer, we've done some work on mammography that we're excited about, but right here we're talking about a breast cancer and a metastatic lymph node biopsy that with our machines, there's less false positives and false negatives. The same is true in lung cancer. So screening CTs, if we allow our machines to read it, it improves the ability to tell patients you actually do have cancer or that nodule doesn't need to come out because it's not cancer. You know, if you're a smoker and you've smoked a pack a day 
for 30 years. We call that a 30-year pack history. Or if you smoke 15 packs a day for two years, a two packs a day for 15 years, that's a 30-year pack history. If you have a 30-year pack history, you should have a screening CT. 2% of people get screening CTs for lung cancer. That number needs to get to 100%, and we would love to be able to partner and make sure that our machines help read those patients. But you know where else we found smoking? And this was a place we weren't looking. We found smoking in the eye. So we used the retina to look for diabetic retinopathy. And we were able to find it, and again, like the other instances, improve accuracy. Actually, we've done so well with the diabetic retinopathy that in partnership with our sister company, Verily, we've now actually launched this in India and Thailand. And where there's a shortage of specialists, patients are now being screened for diabetic retinopathy and getting referred for treatment. But here's the magic beyond that. So we get a Google intern. And these people are super smart. The Google intern comes in, and we're teaching her about machine learning. So we give her pictures of the retina and that data, and we say, go run it against some variables that don't make any sense so you'll see how this thing works. And she comes back and she says to us, well, the machine is predicting 75% of time stated sex, whether this is a male or a female. And we say, well, you're doing it wrong. Go do it again, because there's no difference in the eye between a man and a woman. So she comes back. She wasn't doing it wrong. Now it's at 90%. So what other things did we find in the eye that we weren't looking for? We found smoking, hist smoking history. We can predict your age, your hemoglobin A1C, your blood pressure, your stated sex. We can also combine it with other data sets, and then the predictions get even better, whether that's cardiovascular risk factors, et cetera. So pretty amazing that we can find things that aren't there, we can improve accuracy, and we can predict things. But healthcare as we all know, has so much more to do than what's just happening in your body. So let's go out of the body now, and I hope that we've answered the question, are we serious about health, and start answering the question, can we impact health? So now this picture actually looks like a brain, uh, but it's not. We're outside of the body. This is your typical nursing station in a hospital. And what you'll see in this picture are two things that we're working to completely change. So there's six patients lying in the hospital, and we want to build services and products that take inpatient to outpatient. We think of hospitalization, by and large, as a failure of outpatient care. And outpatient care is a failure of home care. And fundamentally, home care is a failure of community care. So you'll see, and we look forward to sharing with you, ways we can move patients in that direction. The other problem with this picture is that doctor and nurse, or those two nurses, or those two doctors, have not got out of their chair. They are simply becoming data clerks entering information. We're building products that will allow them to go from that chair to the patient bedside so they can look the patient in the eye, hold their hand, and spend time having difficult conversations. So imagine this. Imagine a search bar on top of your EHR that needs no training. You could write pneumonia and CX, C, uh, chest x-ray. You could even spell penicillin wrong. You could ask for blood counts, and we know what you're do thinking about the same way we do when you do Google search in the rest of your life. Imagine this. You're a clinician, and you type 87. You're one of those clinicians in that nursing station. You type 87, and the rest of autocomplete says 87-year-old white female sitting in the emergency room for two days complaining of shortness of breath with a history of stomach cancer. Imagine if we actually did the work for you like we do in so many people's, in the rest of our lives in so many ways. Now, the next thing that I'm going to say gets people a little bit queasy. Um, and I apologize, but if you hear me out, I think it makes sense. Your doctor or your doctors before they operate on you, they actually go to YouTube. So we see that, right? And you think, wow, that's kind of a trip. My doctor's checking out YouTube. Well, when I did my pediatrics internship, I had this little book in my pocket. And when I would put in a chest tube or a lumbar puncture or check a potassium, uh, an increased level of potassium, you'd go to the book, right? You'd go to the book to see what happens. 
So if you have a general surgeon in a small town and they haven't taken out a parathyroid in a long time, actually, YouTube is a great way for them to see up to date by the Mayo Clinic, by a specialist. So we want to continue to build information to allow caregivers to take better care of patients. But again, that's really just scratching the surface because so much of health outcomes have to do with things other than your organs, your genome, or professional caregivers. You know, Google for a long time has been a company that's been focused on helping people. So if we talk Google broadly, we have cars that we're working on that may not crash. We have job searches that allow people to get jobs, and those jobs improve health outcomes. We know that. We have an app that we have in India that in three months, kids in rural villages can make one year of progress in reading by working on the app for three months. And we know that literacy improves health outcomes. But all of us also know when we got a question about our health, where we go. So whether you're Googling about hiccups or lupus or migraines, everybody's going to Google. And what we want to do here, and this is together with all of you, is to make this information more authoritative. We want to make sure that if you're asking questions about lupus, that it's the most up-to-date information in a way that's understandable, and we need help to make sure we can achieve that. The other thing that we do beyond the individual is able to use our tools to help communities. Whether you're looking for a treatment center near you, whether we're showing a map of floods so people can get out of the way. And actually, earlier this afternoon, I was using Google Maps to see where the fires are in the Getty Center in West Los Angeles. Those things help communities and save lives, as well as showing you where our narcotic take-back programs are as we work with communities to improve their health. You know, overall, at Google, our mission is to organize the world's information, or I would say the world's health information, and make it universally accessible and useful. The final question that I had to ask myself when I made this decision to go into this tech company, and this was a question I was pretty explicit about. I said, okay, it all sounds great. I got the um, seriousness. I got the impact. But I got to ask you, will you allow me to treat the billions of people that come to us for health searches, the billions of people that look at us on YouTube, the doctors and nurses and pharmacists and social workers that I know we're going to give tools to, will you allow those people to be treated like they're my own patients? Can you assure me that they'll be treated with the highest level of trust and safety, quality, it'll be culturally dignified, it'll be sensitive? Will you allow me to treat them like they're my own patients? And they said yes. And nine months into it, I'm actually certain that that is true and feel very confident in my ability to say what we're providing I would want for my own patients or for my own family. And then there was something that I didn't realize until I was at Google. And what I realized was this magical voyage. There is no way we can do this one alone. And so really, the ask is to join us on this journey, uh, because to fix this thing, it's going to take all of us, and we're delighted to be part of the solution. So today was about meeting Google Health. And uh, on behalf of my colleagues in APAC, in Israel, in London, our teams in Palo Alto, Seattle, and spread out throughout the US, uh, it's a very wonderful pleasure to meet all of you. Thank you. Thank you, David.